Well, good morning, friends and brethren. Very good to see you today. Good to see each one, and again, to see some visitors with us. We're very glad that you are here. Month of October is almost past. We're just on the very tail end of it. And it was the month of October, the first of October, a year ago, that Sandra and I came, started assembling here with the church at Taylor's and started my work here. It's been a year already, and that's just hard to believe. It's been quite an incredible year at that. We moved twice. We moved, and, 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 yeah. and I, I don't mind some sympathy, and Ben wants some sympathy in that, too. And then the whole virus thing, wow. It's just been an incredible year. But it's been incredible in some really great ways, too. We've enjoyed our time getting to know you and being a part of the church and, and uh, becoming a part of the work. It's been very exciting to us. And God willing, we look forward to more years in the future. I don't say it too often, and I feel like I need to say this more often, that I appreciate so much the support of the church here. Not and not the, the spiritual support, the encouragement that is given along the way, the financial support, too. You know, for a long time, for many years, my preaching was done on the side, so to speak. It felt like full-time work, but I work secular work to make my livelihood. And so it's only been for a, a few years that I've been preaching full-time, as we say. And, you know, I just appreciate the fact that you help in that, you sacrifice to help to provide support for Ben and I so that we can devote ourselves fully to this work. And I'm very grateful for that, and I want you to know that. The word Christian is used quite liberally today, both in kind and in unkind ways. And there's quite a few who would identify themselves as Christian. And in a very general sense, it describes the difference between those who are atheists or Jews or, who, or Hindus or followers of Islam and those who are believers in Christ. It helps make that distinction. And so sometimes the word Christian is used to identify those who, well, you have those who are Christian. Just identifying the fact that they don't follow one of these other beliefs, but that they believe in Jesus. And yet we find that there are a number of Jesus believers who are people that are of different religions, different beliefs that are not too similar. And they all call themselves, though, by the same designation, Christian. Are all who believe in Jesus Christians? Well, some would say yes, and they use the term quite freely that way. But if that's the case, why are there so many Different religions. I'm, I'm talking about Christian religions. Because we have Methodist Christians and we have Baptist Christians and we have Presbyterian Christians and Catholic Christians and, and the list goes on and on. And if you look at the creed books that these religions would use or follow, you will certainly find that they consider themselves to be Christians and we might even refer to them that way. But would scripture agree with that usage. It's reasonable for us to ask the question, who is a Christian? The question is easy enough to understand, but sometimes the answer is a little more difficult to find. And uh, it's not because scripture is unclear, but because of the way the term is used in our vernacular and is so common in our society. It may depend on who you ask as to what kind of answer you receive. And there's a lot of different ideas on the matter. Dictionaries aren't too helpful, I found out. When I was growing up, we had this dictionary that was about this thick. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was, it was great big. It was one of those dictionaries that my mom bought a week at a time. At the local AMP store, she would buy a little section of that dictionary every week for 25 cents. And you would kind of put it in this binder. And over the course of I don't know how many weeks, you wound up with this huge dictionary. And I remember looking in there one time many years ago, the word Christian, and there were 21 definitions in there. I'm not sure any one of them would be a biblical definition, but there was, it just illustrated to me the fact that men answered the question, who is a Christian, in many different ways. And in fact, if we were to go down to the mall down here at Haywood Mall and walk around inside, and we asked people, we said, I'd like to ask you a question, who is a Christian? And get their response. 
I don't know how many different answers we would get. But there'd be a lot of different answers that we would receive. You know, there are some who would limit who is a Christian to a good moral person. You know, someone who is very kind and would do anything for you. He's a good Christian, some would say. Or some would say, well, if someone belongs to any kind of a Christian church, a denomination, you know, what, what they are a Christian. And many would even say anyone who is religious is a Christian. But asking the opinions of men, this question is only going to give us the opinions of men. What does God have to say about the matter? Whom does God consider to be a Christian? What does the Bible say about who is a Christian? It's interesting that the word Christian is found only three times in the New Testament. Well, you can look at some modern versions of the Bible, and you might find it in there a few more times than that. But in a, in a version that follows the Greek text carefully, there's only three times. Three times that the word Christian is found. You can find it in 1 Peter chapter 4. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Well, we learn from that that Christians sometimes suffer because of their faith, but it still doesn't tell us exactly who is a Christian. Or, or maybe when it was the Apostle Paul speaking to Agrippa, and Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. But of itself, that still doesn't tell us who is a Christian. I would suggest that our clue comes from Acts chapter 11. I'd like you to look with me to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, you might recall here the context of this, Paul and Barnabas working with the church in Antioch. And it was here in Acts 11, verse 26, that, or verse 25, then Barnabas departed to Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Well, that gives us a little insight. That, that gives us a clue right there, doesn't it? But you know, it leads to another question, because now we have to answer, who's a disciple? Because it's the disciples who are called Christians, so who is a disciple? That word itself, that term is interesting to me, disciple. And long ago, it really was a word that kind of came from education, meaning one who was a learner, one who was a student. One who follows a teacher. That was the idea and the meaning of a disciple. And so in the first century, it is my understanding that that probably was pretty well understood. It was clearly understood. And if we think about it in that, that school realm, education realm, we think about an ancient university. My impression is that they operated a little differently than what we see today. The teacher in an ancient university was much more hands-on. And those who were enrolled in his class spent a great deal of time with the teacher, and followed him around and saw the things that he did. They followed him to the marketplace to see how he would work and deal with, with situations in the marketplace. Or when he was debating with the city leaders, they were there listening to what he had to say, considering the wisdom that was coming from the one who was their teacher. And, and they recognized the teacher as the one who spoke with authority and his knowledge and wisdom qualified him for the position he was in being the teacher. And the students may even be, be proud of the fact that they were disciples of a teacher, particularly one who was notable and had a good reputation. And they were watching and they were listening to what he had to say. They were learning. They were following him. The authority of the teacher was valued, and the students became imitators of the teacher. It was even the Apostle Paul who made reference to the fact that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, that great Jewish teacher of the age, one who was well known. And you might say that at least for a period of time, Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. But then we narrow this down a little bit more. Who is a disciple of Christ? Think about this. Who is a disciple of Christ? That is one who is a follower, one who is a learner, one who looks to Christ as the teacher, as the authority. Jesus had disciples who walked with him, 
who recognized him as the teacher. Those who became his apostles first were the ones who spent the most time with him. And they heard Jesus speak throughout Galilee and other places about the kingdom of God. And they, they saw the many wonders and works that Jesus did to confirm the words that he was speaking. And the miracles that Jesus did went on to prove more, proved his, his deity. And then he called them to follow him. We're looking at the book of Luke. Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus with his closest disciples... Luke chapter 5 and verse 10. You remember the fishermen. Jesus was there with the fishermen as he called them to be disciples. In verse 10 it says that there was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Well, sure they did. They were his disciples. And in the same chapter, if we look a little farther, verse 27, there was another who was called. And after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. See, that gives us some insight about what it was to be a follower of Jesus. It was in a very literal sense, wasn't it? That these disciples were following Jesus. And these and some others that Jesus called in this special way followed him day after day and heard day after day the things he had to say, the way he dealt with people in the marketplace, the way he dealt with the Jewish leaders that were so antagonistic against him. They heard these things and they listened to what Jesus had to say. And, you know, in time, the apostles would have to stand on their own character when Jesus had ascended to heaven and it was the apostles that were going out and teaching and testifying of the things of Christ, their actions reflected the teaching of their master. Look at Acts chapter 4. You remember the case here where the apostles had been teaching and preaching Christ in the kingdom and they had some opposition to say the least. And Peter and John were arrested but they went on teaching and preaching Christ. And verse 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Indeed, they were his disciples. They were students of Jesus. They were learners of Jesus. They were followers of Jesus. That is what a disciple is. So that leads us to another question. We understand Christians in the biblical sense, are those who are disciples of Jesus, well then, how does one become a disciple? Jesus didn't leave us without instruction. In fact, before his ascension, it was again some of the last instruction that he gave to his closest disciples. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to teach. We're going to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. You remember the text. You remember the scene, Jesus with the 11 at this point. And Jesus said to them, saying, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy, uh, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what Jesus said. This gives us insight once again on, on what it is to become, how one becomes a disciple of Jesus. Make disciples, he said. Make disciples. King James Version says teach. Teach really is here just a verb form of the word disciple. Make disciples is a little bit more descriptive. There was teaching that had to take place. The idea of making disciples was, was that these apostles, they would go out teaching all that they had seen and heard of Jesus. They were testifying of him. Before anything else can happen, before anyone can respond, there has to first be teaching. And the reason for teaching is specific. To make disciples. The source of teaching is God's specified 
The word is needed for that because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17 would say. There is nothing more than God's word that is needed to instruct, to lead someone to become a disciple of Christ. There is no other doctrine that is commanded. There is no other doctrine that is needed to make one to become a learner or a student or a follower of Christ. God has given us all that is needed. The Lord has left instructions on what it is to become a child of God and how we must do that. What is to be taught? God has given and provided that. To teach or to make disciples is to bring people into a relationship with Christ that they never had before. Teaching is necessary to help us understand the need of being a disciple and what it means. But then how are disciples made? Jesus said, by baptizing them. This is how disciples are made. Jesus teaches us that, that to, to be enrolled in a relationship with him, so to speak, back to that university analogy. Well, one, one has to be baptized. The necessity that this of necessity says to us something more than just believing is necessary. I know that there are many in the religious realm today that speak of their relationship with Christ simply through belief that Jesus is the son of God. I would not discount for a moment the need of believing that Jesus is the son of God. But when we start teaching, and there are so many doctrines that do, that all that is necessary is to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, we've missed what Jesus had to say about the matter. Jesus could have easily said, make disciples by teaching them to believe in me. But that's not what he said. He said to teach or to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. A true baptized believer, that's what Jesus was looking for. Jesus made the point clear, and what others have to say about the matter really does not matter. There are some today who would proclaim that they were saved when they took Jesus into their heart. But Jesus doesn't say that. Or there are some who say that, that it happened, that they were saved when they professed their belief in Christ. Or when they prayed the sinner's prayer. And, and that's all interesting, but it's not what Jesus said at all. And in fact, we can't even find those things in Scripture. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer found in Scripture. Oh, I, I've read it in some books of doctrine written by men, but I've not read it anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. One cannot truly be a disciple of Jesus just by being a believer. But a believer who is compelled to obey Jesus, uh, what Jesus commanded, to be baptized, to be baptized for the right purposes. Jesus said in Mark 16, a parallel passage, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Understanding that baptism is for the purpose of remission of sins. Uh, Peter had something to say about that in Acts chapter 2 as well. But you know, that's not the end of the matter. There's still more to it than that because Jesus, back in our text, he had something more here to say. Um, you know, concerning the text we were following, Jesus also said, teaching them to observe all things. Not only is teaching a, repre a prerequisite to discipleship, but it is also needed to continue that relationship. That we must learn to be his people. There is teaching that must take place that will lead us and will help us to, to grow in a closer relationship to serve God and, and his people. Apostle Peter would say some 30 years or so later, he would, he would point out the fact to Christians that we are his own special people. In 1 Peter 2 and, and verse 9, it's a blessing to be the people of God. And Paul was making a comparison about how some were walking in the flesh and made a distinction of what Christians were to do. That there was a great change that had to take place. And if you'll look with me for a moment to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. I feel as though there must have been a reason the apostle was saying this. That these were Christians needing to be reminded of the contrast of those who are walking the ways of the world and those who are walking with Christ. Because in chapter 4, verse 17 and following, he's talking about those, the Gentiles, who were walking in the futility of their mind. Their understanding darkened. 
that they were far away from God. But in verse 20, the, the, the contrast is made. But you have not so learned Christ. See, this, this takes us back to the point we're making from Matthew 28. Teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. It was teach, make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then do what? Teach them to observe all things. Ephesians 4 verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Here's the change that takes place. This is the continued learning that has to take place. These were the ones who heard him, were taught by him, put off the old, put on the new. Righteousness and true holiness becomes a part of the lives of those who are disciples of Jesus. It's interesting. That we see the same pattern in Acts chapter 2. We talked about Acts chapter 2 some just a couple of weeks ago. We won't spend a great deal of time here. But just in Acts chapter 2, if we think about this for a moment, I find it interesting. That on that day of Pentecost long ago, there were many who became baptized believers. And you can't help but notice the pattern. The, the chapter is filled with teaching about Jesus Christ, his purpose, his deity. Uh, his sacrifice. And in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel. Know assuredly that God has made this Jesus. Whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. And now when they heard this. They were cut to their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren. What should we do? Here was the result of the teaching that took place. There were those who were convicted. Those who now knew and could see that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Christ, the Son of God, sent to save man from sins. What should we do? Did they believe? Well, yeah. It was so evident that they believed. What should we do? Say the sinner's prayer. Not what he said. Profess your belief in Christ. Experience a warm feeling in your bosom. No, none of these things are said. What should we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were told to do. To teach. Baptize. Make disciples. Is what they were to do. And there were those who were baptized. There was more teaching needed. Verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying be saved from this perverse generation. Were they saved yet? No they weren't. Verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And about the same day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Teach. Make disciples. Baptize. And then teach. It's the same pattern. You see, in verse 42, we find that what happened after these became Christians was there was still teaching. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. That's what they did. They continued in that relationship with Jesus. Many of you that have experienced this. Someone that we've been studying with, someone who seemingly is, is honest in their approach to scripture and wants to know what they must do to be saved. And, and we teach and we make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Lord. And then we see little of them. And in time, we see nothing of them. They do not continue to grow in any way in Christ. There's no study that takes place and they just kind of go. The instruction of Jesus was to teach and to make disciples, uh, baptizing them and continuing to teach them in all things. That's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. The apostles were following explicitly the commands of the Lord before he ascended into heaven. To continue in that relationship. We have to continue to walk as a disciple of Christ. Jesus knew that could be a challenge, and he dealt with that, I think, on a number of occasions. Uh, none more so than in John chapter 8 and verse 31. 
And I think he makes a point here very clear. John chapter 8 and verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You've experienced this as have I. There are a lot of people who say they are followers of Jesus. There are a lot of people who say they are Christians. And in fact, they may have a lot to say about the matter. You know, when we lived in Asheville, I was always amazed at how many people were willing to make their car into a billboard. I mean, the back of their car is just bumper stickers, not on the bumper, but on the back of the car and on the back windshield. And sometimes that traffic light, you didn't have time to read all of them. Usually I gave up and over time I realized most of what they had to say, I didn't agree with. So I didn't read it all. But it was just interesting to me that, that, that that's a region of our country where some people can be very outspoken and, uh, and willing to tell you about their opinions. And, um, you know, it's, it's that way in the religious, so, uh, religious realm, religious society as well. That there are some very willing to tell us what they believe and what they think about, about spiritual things. But you know what? It's, there's a great difference between saying, I'm a Christian, but demonstrating that in our life, living it. It's easy to say the words come out pretty easy. But actually living it is something else. <laughs> if you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed. That's what Jesus said. You know, there are many, I'm afraid, who give a lot of lip service to being a follower of Christ, not their feelings of service to God. And it's expressed in a lot of different ways, whether it's bumper stickers on the back of a car, or it's a t-shirt, where for a while it's real popular, I have a t-shirt that said 316, reference to John 316, I would presume. And yet sometimes you'd see somebody who is wearing a t-shirt like that, and you look at what they're doing as they're holding a bottle of beer, and you're thinking, really? This is how you exemplify Christ? In your life or, or wearing a cross it seems with some the bigger of the cross the more religious they think they are and yet still sometimes you look at people doing such things and it's very easy to see the life they're living does not demonstrate the attitude or the life of Christ in any way that's what I mean when I say it's easy to give lip service to being a Christian it's something else to live it. It's something else to demonstrate it in our life. Words come out easily. If we go back to the analogy of the university again, back to the school. If you go to a university, you know, it, it may be even that you, know, you wear the T-shirt, you wear the, the sweatshirt with your school name on it because you're proud. You know, you're a part of this school. And this would apply to a number of our folks here, wouldn't it? Uh, alumni and students alike. You know, um, you, you, you're proud of the fact that you're going to that school. But over time, you, you fail going to the classes. You know, you're not keeping up with your, your classes and, and your grades show that because you've not learned anything. You've stopped being the disciple, the learner, the student that you need to be. And that's going to be reflected in time. And, and you, you are not knowledgeable about what the school is supposed to be teaching you. And you're not a follower of the words that are being taught. You know, are you still going to be considered a student of that university? Well, maybe to the end of that term. And that's about all. There's an ending point, isn't there? And we all understand that. We all get that. And yet... Sometimes there are even those who have become New Testament Christians, baptized believers following the biblical order. And yet over time, their service to God, that, that, that continued uh, desire and thirst for learning and growing and being in Bible classes and worship, over time, that seems to become less and less and less. And yet if you ask them or someone says, do you go to church? Oh, yeah, I go to church over here. 
you know, they, they still think of themselves as a member of the Lord's church. And over time, they don't even attend at all. Oh, yeah. It, this would always amaze me. Back, back in Tennessee, you know, sometimes there would be an obituary and it would say a member of such and such church of Christ. I'm here for a while. Hickory Heights Church of Christ. That's where we were at for a number of years. I'd look at that name and I'd think, I'd say, Sandra, I said, do you know who they are? Well, they hadn't, they hadn't darkened the door of a church building in 20 years, not because they were unable. It's because they had stopped being that disciple. They stopped being that student, that learner, that one who was serving the master. They stopped that a long time ago, and yet they still thought, really? We know better than that, don't we? Many talk about following Jesus. But the only way we can follow him is to follow in his words. Go to the book of John with me in chapter six. Just a few verses here, just very quickly. We're going to read through and be reminded a little bit of some circumstances. These are the words of Jesus. We'll be reading all the way through these, these verses. In Acts chapter six, it was quite a multitude, quite a following of Jesus. And yet, Jesus came to a point where he knew some of them were following him just for personal reasons, just to, to gain something from him. And he taught them some things that were hard. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. The words that Jesus speaks to us are important for us to know and to follow. And the text would go on to say that there are many who turned away and walked with him no more. And in verse 68, in verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away also? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. Indeed. Chapter 8, verse 31. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be remain in you and that your joy may be filled. Chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's just a few verses, but there's some key points. Everything that leads to a relationship with God is through his words. Spirit, life, discipleship, eternal life, cleansing, judging, joy, peace. We read about all of those. All of those come to us through his word. Many speak of receiving the blessings of Christ, but they don't know what the words of Jesus are. It's amazing sometimes to, to talk with those who would claim to be religious, who say that they are Christians, and yet you sit down with them for a Bible study, and, uh, and you have to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. the book of Acts, it's right after the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts is the next one you'll find. They can't navigate through Scripture. Over and over again, that happens. And that they'll tell you right away, I'm a Christian. Really? We don't know the words of God. But we're a Christian. And it seems for many, they don't care enough to study or to follow. And that's what discipleship is all about. Following the Lord. And the point is very well made that to be a Christian, we have to follow the teaching of the one who brings us into the relationship with God. And that would be his son, Jesus Christ. 
And it was Jesus who said, go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. That's what the Lord says. And so when we try to deal with these questions like, who is a Christian? When we go back to Bible basics on these things, it's not so hard to understand. It's confusing to us when, when we let our minds be cluttered up with all the ideas that men have presented to us about what Christianity is and what it's all about. But when we go right back to what Scripture says, no, it's not that hard. The Lord has laid it out for us in such a way that we can understand. And so either we are willing to walk in the shadow of the cross and all that that entails, or we are standing outside. And standing outside is not where we need to be. I'm going to deal with this question. It's always kind of a difficult one to deal with. Are there followers of Christ or are there Christians in all churches? It's a question that comes up from time to time. And I always hate to answer the question if it's just point blank, just, you know, how do you answer this? You know, there's a little bit more of an explanation here. We've been working on that this morning. There's some explanation that has to be made. It's an emotional question for some. And sometimes we have to remove the emotion and we just have to listen to what the Bible says. There are many points that can be made on this matter. And there are people who say, well, I know that I'm in the right church. And to which I sometimes say, well, how do you know? And the answers that you get back are quite interesting. My pastor told me I'm in the right church. Oh, okay. Well, that settles it. Not. Someone said one time, well, I know this is the right church because we have more in attendance at this church than any other church in town. Okay. Oh, well, that settles it. Not. You remember what we were saying about the word? <laughs> remember what Jesus was saying about the word? That's how we determine if we are a Christian or who is a Christian. And there are so many different churches. There are so many different denominations. And yet, and they all think they're right. You can't go to any church or denomination and say, well, you think, is this the right church? Are you all teaching truth? Is this a sound church? They're all going to say yes. It was interesting a few years ago. And I worked in secular work. I ran an engineering shop for an automaker. And, and um, we were kind of a small team. We facilitated a lot of work for other groups that came to us. And there was this one day in particular where we had, I don't know, about a dozen other folks, engineers that had come in. We were working on some project that has been long forgotten. But I won't forget our lunch period. We were all, for some reason, we were all kind of eating in that day. And we had a team room. We were in a big table in there. And. I'd come in there a little bit late and everybody was kind of eating and there was some interesting conversation going on. It was spiritual conversation. That didn't happen much with my teammates. That just, that just, that just didn't come around too often. So I came in and I put something in the microwave. Sandra had made me a lunch that day and, and then I'm here warming that up and I'm listening to the conversation and I just cut the tail end of it a little bit. And someone said, well, and so this is the conversation. Someone said, well, I'm a Mormon Christian. Someone else said, I'm a Lutheran Christian. And someone else said, well, I'm a Baptist Christian. And there was a Presbyterian Christian. I think we had about all flavors there. And as they were going around the room, I knew sooner or later it was going to come to me. And so I was trying to think a little bit about how was, how was I going to answer this? And finally, they got all done. Someone said, Joe, you know, what kind of a Christian are you? And I said, well... I'm just a Christian, just a plain Christian, like the kind you read about in the Bible and nowhere else. And it kind of got quiet. And there was no discussion much that took place after that. I tried, but that was it. But it was telling to me. There were all kinds of Christians in the minds of men. Well, who do you follow? Let's turn it around a little bit. Who do you follow? Who are you a disciple of? Well, if you're a Mormon, you're a disciple. You are a follower. You are a learner of Joseph Smith. If you're a Methodist, 
I guess we would probably claim that to be John Wesley. And if you are a Lutheran, well, there's Martin Luther. If you're a Baptist, well, it was John Smith that kind of put the peg in the ground in 1680 as far as that religion would go. And it goes on and on and on. But what the Lord said, I am the way of the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 and verse 6. So we're still trying to deal with this question. Are there Christians in all denominations and all churches? Well, are there people in all denominations that are baptized scripturally? Remember, Jesus said, teach, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Remember? God, Jesus gave the criteria right there. And yet there are those who, who, who simply teach sprinkling. Sprinkling of infants for baptism. But Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 tell us something about being buried with Christ in baptism. And then there's the teaching of infants again that, that is talked about in, in so many religions. But the Bible says nothing about that at all. Bible baptism requires you being a believer. Remember we talked about being a baptized believer. That's what scripture requires. And that comes through faith in the fact that Jesus is the son of God and being able to actually confess that faith, the ability to believe, to repent, to confess. Infants can do none of those things. Some teach that baptism, baptism is simply for the purpose of membership in their church. That's what some church manuals would say and, and teach specifically. And yet scripture tells us that baptism is to wash away our sins. Uh, why do you tarry, arise, and be baptized and wash away your sins? Ananias said to Saul in Acts 22 and verse 16. And we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, you know, to be baptized for remission of sins. Specifically, the text would say there. Some people say the kind of baptism that we receive doesn't matter at all. They acknowledge that there's many kinds of baptism. Can one be a Christian and be baptized in a denominational baptism? Some would say yes. But scripture says to us, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's all we read about in scripture. The Lord has dictated that baptism is required of contrite believers. Burial on water is necessary. Baptism that is for the remission of sins that washes away our sins. And one cannot be a disciple of Christ and not be baptized into Christ by the means and the methods that Jesus has specified for us. The Apostle Paul confirmed such teaching in Galatians 3, verse 26, For if you are all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Are there Christians in all denominations? Well, denominations enroll members into their church by the standards that they have set. I have some books in my office over here you're welcome to look at sometime. You know, Mormon, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, you know, Jehovah's Witness. And they all have criteria of what it is to become a Christian. And you know, every one of them is different from the other. They're all different. They all have different ideas. But Jesus told us what we must do. And any of the ideas that man proposes to us that is different than what Jesus says to us cannot be right. It was Jesus who set the pattern. Who is a Christian? Baptized believers. Baptized believers. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Baptized for the remission of sins. Those who continue to observe all things that he has commanded. That's what we find in scripture. It sure is different than what many teach. Hope the lesson's helpful to you. You've listened so well. It could be even today that there is someone who needs to respond to the gospel. And I'm hoping that you would not delay because the time is now. If you have come to a point of understanding that Jesus is the son of God. And that without him, you're outside. You're standing outside. You are without, without hope. You're without salvation. Help, hope, salvation is found in Christ. You need to respond to that. Why would you wait? Can we help you even today as we stand and sing?